Okay, next up from the uh, University of Otago, uh, working with Andrew Cridge and Peter Dearden, uh, is Joshua Gilligan. And Josh is going to talk about a DNA sequencing method for determining the floral origin of honey. So hi everyone, I'm Josh from the Lab of Evolution and Development in the Biochemistry Department at the University of Otago and that's what I'm going to talk about today up there. So I know this is going to seem really, really basic for some of you, but I am a geneticist that has recently come into this, so part of this background is the kind of stuff that I would have wanted when I was coming into it. So. As you all know, honey is this incredibly important source of revenue for New Zealand. Um, each honey has its own uh, unique profile that is made up of that mix of nectar and pollen gathered by bees, um, as these go on to contributing to its distinguishing characteristics. Um, furthermore, if these characteristics are in enough quantity, that can kind of govern where it's labelled as either monofloral or multifloral. Over the years, consumer demand has increased for a lot of these monofloral varieties, especially in New Zealand because of those, some of those health benefits like Manuka, um, and leaning into these monofloral demands for a lot of these um, products is going to help increase um, all of our consumer satisfaction and also knowing what plants uh, have been used to make honey and being able to scientifically back that up is going to be really really good for your marketing and to try and say hey this is it and I can prove that it's specifically from this. So how do we go about determining how uh, what plants have actually been used for honey? So the old way is with this Melisso palynology and it's basically you get the honey you take pollen from it you look at it down a microscope and then you try and define it on its physical characteristics like its shape and size and colour. This can have a lot of problems because two pollens from the exact same plant can look almost entirely different just based on its orientation or just its field of view. Um, and because of this, uh, a lot of expert analysis is needed to properly identify these and even that has its own um, innate problems with human error. So here's some pollen under an electron microscope to give a, a bit more resolution on it. And here are a couple of pollens um, that are often commonly misidentified as each other and the associated cost if they were a monofloral variety. Um, so as you can see, this is under an electron microscope. From a normal microscope, it would be really, really hard for your average person to do this, and that's going to increase cost of trying to um, do this. Another way to go about this is through DNA sequencing and all these DNA technologies have become a lot more frequent over the years um, and I'm just going to go through the basics of it so we're all on the same page. So you get a sample, you take out all of that DNA, you amplify it for um, specific markers, then you can go to an online resource and assign it to plants on those resources and then look at the ratios of them and then overall quantify how much of each plant was used to make that specific one. To take a look at this um, just from a, a very broad um, approach of the workflow for DNA technologies, you get your sample, you extract it to pull out that DNA, sequence it, and then analysis. The extraction step of this is really, really difficult because pollen has this incredibly um, durable structure. It's evolved to survive droughts, it's evolved to survive forest fires. Um, it does this by this really, really um, dense network of cellulose fibers interconnected with each other. And it's that durability from that that makes it really hard to pull DNA out of. And that means that traditional DNA extractions often end up being quite long, rely on harmful chemicals or um, irritating mechanical lysis methods, and they're really hard to adapt to automated um, services. 
So this is where I was brought into this sort of project and I was kind of told, hey, find an alternative method for extraction, hopefully one that is short, doesn't rely on toxic chemicals, and you can adapt it for um, automation, or to reduce cost to try and develop a low-cost honey test for producers on small scale. So after a lot of trial and error, we came across this compound, 4-methylmorpholine in oxide monohydrate, that's really hard to say, I've practiced so much. Um, so we're just gonna to refer to it as MNNO. We came across this by collaboration with the Brownfield Lab um, in Otago, as they also work on a lot of pollen-based stuff. So to give you a bit of a background on MNNO, it's normally used in the textile industries um, to break down plant material to produce certain fabrics. So I was thinking, hey, that's great for us, um, there was even a paper in the 1970s just based on just straight pollen, um, and then I tried to make it work on pollen that I had gotten out of honey. So, yeah, um, it's really cheap, which really goes a long way into developing a low-cost test, um, and it means my boss isn't angry when I buy a lot of it. Um, and through a lot of trialing, it, um, we came across a quite an easy extraction method, which is basically just you have this pollen, you add this reagent to it, and then you add heat and just wait, and that's it. So here it is actually being used on some samples. Over here is just some clover um, monofloral varieties that I bought from the supermarket, and here is um, from one of those traditional kind of lysis methods. It's really early days for this method, and we haven't got any DNA sequencing back from it yet, um, but we are intending on doing that later in the year just to make sure that there's no inherent biases towards certain types of pollen that's gonna end up um, inhibiting things down the line. Because this extraction is so simple, it means that you can do it um, in an automated way. And in the lab, we've got this, which is our um, liquid handling robot. He's got a couple of these silver things, two here and one down the back, which are basically just heat pads. So he can do 396 samples at once, which is way more than I can do by hand. And this really goes a long way to starting to reduce cost for developing this um, test. This method also doesn't use as much starting material as a lot of other stuff. The actual um, compound itself is a lot safer, doesn't produce any noxious fumes, and um, can be done in this automated way. So in summary, honey flora origins is really, really important for both producers and consumers. The only way to verify this is through pollen identification. Um, and the easier we can do this in the lab goes further into trying to make a test that is a lot um, more applicable to you guys. Overall, this method goes to show that there are cheaper and um, safer methods out there, and we've got a long way to go um, in trying to get a low-cost test for all of you. Thanks for all these people for contributing to the work before I got here and for some funding. Thanks, any questions? No, cool. Um, how are you going to account for the, um, the, the Rewarewas and the Taris, which got very poor pollen production, as opposed to a Kanuka or a Clover Lotus, which got really high levels of pollen in their honey? I think that would have to go into the more analysis side of it and kind of look at what ends up going for um, being representational for that based on traditional pollen counts by experts from honeys made by those to try and compare it and say, oh, if there's only this amount of pollen, but we know that this amount of pollen is um, actually means that it was used this much, we can just put that into the analysis step to go forward and do it that way. Cool, cheers.